Um, I thought I, I studied at Edinburgh College of Art in Scotland. Uh, I studied drawing and painting. Um, I had some early success with my paintings. I won an award that was the Young Scottish Artist of the Year. And I had a London gallery and things were pretty good. Uh, and for whatever reason, I was awarded a small travel scholarship and I chose to go to Japan for three months. So this is me in Hagi in 1990. Um, and there was a tea ceremony for my benefit. There's me, there's a few, a few photographs of me throughout the top, mostly to give scale to the work. That's me up Mount Fuji uh, on the same trip. And so began my uh, interest with Japan and my interest with Japanese woodblock printing. When I got back to Scotland, I had a, an exhibition of uh, kind of oil paintings with crusty oil with kind of Japanese imagery. But along with that, I uh, started doing some very large woodcuts. But this was using oil and using an etching press to print them. Uh, but the, I mean, the very first woodcut I did was just a small black and white, and then I went straight to this sort of side. I used quite a lot of power tools. And the nicest thing about this was this was part of a symposium with two Japanese printmakers. And um, one of them, Atsushi Inoue, who's still a friend, 27 years later, um, he did, he used the traditional Japanese techniques of watercolor printing. So I was fascinated by this. And um, he suggested that if I wanted to learn it, that I should study in Japan. So that planted the seed which um, brought me to study in Japan in uh, 96, finishing in 2000. I was on the Monbusha scholarship. Japanese government funded the, the, the whole trip. I had to learn Japanese language and I was there for three and a half years. So this jumps, this is, this is I, I, I don't want to go through the whole repertoire of my work. It's specifically about how did I arrive at making sculptural mokahanga, and how did I arrive uh, with making larger prints, and the interplay between the two, two forms. So this is 2007. Uh, I was on a residency in uh, Sandnes, which is near Stavanger in Norway. The previous day I'd been uh, walking up in the amazing fjords <coughs> in the landscape. I was completely bowled over by this day trip. And that evening in the studio I made imagery that's very like this one on the left, but they were very just simplified fjords in black and white sumi ink, uh, kind of instigated by the fact that I had knocked over a bottle of sumi ink, which was quite expensive. And I normally I use colour, predominantly. And I started using these very simple, um, simplified ideas of fjords that I'd been in. Uh, working till probably about two o'clock in the morning, very frustrated with what I was doing. Snacking on a box of dates, and I wrapped the print around the date box. I liked it. I went home feeling quite happy. The next morning, I was quite excited about getting back to the studio, and I made a companion piece of another date box. And this was the kind of the things of a conceptual shift in my own work. So then I went out of my way to find uh, wooden box lids, as a kind of tradition of that in Scandinavia. And again, I wrapped and made prints purposely to wrap around these, these forms. 
Uh, there's a kind of Japanese writing on some of the, the pages. I was using pages from uh, old Meiji accounts, partly because the paper was over 100 years old, and it meant that I could print with paper that wasn't really sized, and I could play with the idea of uh, the print moving a little bit, bleeding a little bit, or not. This was called Nest. I then uh, expanded that series, and again, I guess the idea that no longer are you confined to a sort of square print format, but the kind of space that's all around these forms. Uh, this was about rooftops in Stavanger. I then uh, continued this idea back in Scotland. Um, just with objects that resonated with, with, with me, with, 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 with that experience in Norway. So I started using the Mokahanga to wrap these different forms. The form on the right is the piano key. And that the, um, at the same time, the, the flat Mokahanga that I was using was often using uh, similar colours, similar forms that I was translating into the sculptural work. <coughs> Jumping forward a little bit, I, uh, I mean again, in a way, there's not, nothing's that linear in most artists' work. In between all of this period, I was, had a residency in, in Dublin, in Ireland, and I actually was in a, in a workshop famous for etching. And I did a series over two months of uh, works that combined etching and mokahanga. I also had a residency in Edinburgh in a sculpture workshop uh, for two months. And at, that, at the sculpture workshop, I took that earlier form that you saw, which was about this size, and I made it, uh, I scaled it up three times, so it was this size. So then starts the, the idea of um, not just using a found object, but actually building forms that I would then wrap with the local hunger. Um, and at the same time, I was stretching up the scale of um, the prints I was making. In my earlier work, when I studied uh, in Japan with the Mokohanga, I kind of, in my paintings, there was a lot of imagery. And uh, through the process of working with the different tools and the different equipment in Japan, the imagery got very much more simplified. And as I worked more and more with the Mokohanga, I got more and more interested in no imagery or less imagery or imagery that was condensed or abstracted and I became more and more interested in just the inherent beauty of Mokahanga in the, the different effects you can get with the printing, soft printing, hard printing, uh, grain, no grain, uh, Uh, this was my studio, not the studio I'm currently in, the studio um, prior to that. Um, a lot of the studio was given over to storage. I felt very crammed in the sort of space I was making from the scale of the kind of prints I wanted to make. Um, but I wanted to illustrate that, that this, this is just simply a physical problem of how much space can you, can, can you work in. Um, it also had, uh, that's, I had this little mezzanine, so I could go upstairs and look down on the prints I was working on. Um, the, uh, on the larger scale, what I found was that it was very difficult to visualize what the end piece would be. So there was a lot of uh, working on maybe two halves at once. And, um, 
uh, stopping and starting and changing, just in the way that you would work with an abstract work. I was, I was doing it in a kind of a painterly way. Uh, also, in the studio, I was very affected by the light, um, which I loved. It was, the, the, the sunlight used to move around the studio. And I think that really had an influence on the on the sculpture work I was making as well. Uh, it harks back to the idea of the, the original inspiration of being in the in the fjords in Norway, where you, often you would have one half of the fjord in shadow and one half in sunlight. And often I'd work in diptychs. Uh, this was a traditional wooden violin case in Scotland and I, I adapted the form and kind of cut, cut bits off of it to give it a more interesting shape. It's an installation kind of uh, often at that time as well because my studio is quite small you uh, Better watch my time. You, I, you. It was often only when I was exhibiting that um, I could actually see more clearly the, the relationships with, between things. If you're in a small studio and you're working on one work and you think it relates to another work, it, it becomes very frustrating. And, and liberating when you then actually have an exhibition and you can put the work up on the wall and start to see sort of colour relationships, forms, shapes and how they echo and move between the things. But Japan's always been an inspiration. I, um, I try and go about every two or three years. Um, I think fundamentally the sort of Japanese aesthetic was was the, the main thing and the more mere interest. But when you see a photograph of this kind of uh, views through the windows, the shapes and forms of the tatamis and the sliding doors, it kind of filters through to a lot of the work when I was doing it. Uh, And always working in series so that they kind of relate to each other. Um, it's kind of like getting an idea and, and just running with it until it runs out in a kind of a way. Uh, often I've used varnish on the wood too. This is a, this varnish on here and this varnish up in some of these parts. It's something that was advocated uh, where I studied uh, at Tamil Art University, used quite a lot, and um, used in different ways. Um, I'm just going to run two to get back to some of the structural things. Uh, this is called Black Rain. I guess there's been some talks this morning about some relationship to ecology, what's going on in the world. But behind a lot of the prints, although they're abstract, they're abstracted, they're often, uh, for me, relate to events in the world. They relate to feelings about uh, the landscape, what's going on. Uh, often it's just hinted at in the title. <laughs> This was a piece that, uh, again, it harks back to that initial impulse uh, of uh, fjords in, in Norway. It's called um, Echo, I think. Maybe Echo 2. Um, it was interesting for me because it was selected for an exhibition in Japan of Mopohanga, and they selected the, one of the sculptural prints. Um, for an exhibition in uh, the Metropolitan Museum. And literally, it was really about 
that memory of that story experience I had. So the sunlight, the shadows, the har. In fact, it's called har. I remember now. Har is the sort of sea fog that comes into the fjords. You get it in Scotland too. If you want to ask anything, feel free. The forms are, are predominantly made from uh, solid tulip wood. Um, I would gesso them to seal them. Uh, and often, maybe on the, if, if I go back to the front face of the work, uh, often parts of them I would add um, marble dust and polishing them up so they're very, very shiny. Um, Uh, let's just run through a kind of series of... What's the scale of each part? Yeah, they're about this height. Yeah. About this point. Again, as I said, in, in my work in general, um, working on series is so you just run with an idea and just brush and soak it. Um, are some of them painted or is it all paper wrap? It's all Mokahanga wrap, yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's a good question. And the, I, I guess the essential thing is that the Mokohanga gives you marks and texture, textures that are completely unique. And, and those are the neck textures and the, the qualities that I love. So... Uh, are you mounting them on wet gesso? No. The gesso dries and then... The gesso is dry. The gesso is mostly to seal the from the wood. Seal any possibilities of, of uh, acid leaching sure. from the woods. So how are you mounting them on the... <laughs> With a kind of mixture of rice paste and other glues. Give <laughs> 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 all your secrets away. Um, and also, just basically, I got more and more skillful. And meanwhile, uh, we'll come to it. I, I came back to, as an invited artist to my lab and uh, me lab. And uh, part of that experience was making Japanese uh, yogu, and uh, it just it just heightens your understanding of the papers, what the limits of what the paper can do. Sometimes in the beginning, when I was doing these wraparounds prints, that you know things would just you 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 kind of have to you know, pull it and make attention in, in the work, and it, the bit would just fall apart. So you, 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 you have to become more and more comfortable with what's going on. I did a lot, a big series of uh, these more simplified forms. But I don't want to illustrate too many of them. Back to Japan, any chance I can possibly get. Um, Again, sometimes it's, it's a one day, one day of a heightened experience of looking at things. It could be one day of drawing, one day that just, that just gives you something strong. Um, this was a day in a particular park in Tokyo. And uh, in a kind of a way, when I got back to Scotland, there was imagination of a combination of the trees, a tree and the, and the kind of brutalist architecture. And uh, I started making these chunkier forms. So this one I started wrapping. And also it coincided with a much bigger studio, much more space. The, the, the amount of space I had to work on in was doubled with uh, storage area. The storage area is even bigger than my, than my working space. And this was great because it allowed me to work on more bigger prints, more sculpture work, more understanding of how things actually all relate to each other. 
so this was this relates directly to that experience of that uh, garden, and it's it's called um, Black Tree City, I think, or something like that, um, and also that play with the a form and how you can redefine it by the printed element so that you it can make it more confusing, it can add a different dimension to the work. Um, something that I, I've enjoyed. So this is the flip side of the same work and again playing with, with that idea that stems from the fjord, that stems from being in a sunlit studio where the light moves around the work. And it, it, it kind of, uh, it hinted at, and, 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 and it kind of gave me a way to, to, to have this idea that you can look at the work one way and it looks like it's sunlit, and from another way it's in the shadow. So, um, that's for skills, obviously. <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> um, uh, I guess, quite simply, um, some of the I started selling some of these big, big prints on, um, for quite good money. And I had a terrible situation where a client uh, bought a piece. It was this piece, actually. And um, it's quite nice to see the scale of it. The, uh, they got it home. They got it hung in, the, in their home. And they have underfloor heating. And the, the panels started warping. Mm -hmm. And the gallery got in touch. And uh, I thought it might be a little, you know, a little bit of movement. It was embarrassing when I saw them really buckled. I just like couldn't, couldn't believe how, how bad it developed the, the uh, technique on a bigger scale. And I damped, <coughs> and took all the tape off, and transferred them onto the aluminium panels and restretched it. And thankfully, it went well because it's, 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 you never want to do that ever. <laughs> um, just a few more. So, is this a single print? It's not a collage of different prints. It's a single print in three sections. So, this would be one section, and this would be another section, and this would be you no. Know, this is a section. This here, and uh, this one here. Uh, but also. It's in three sections because it, I can only handle a sheet of paper that that's big in terms of dampening the paper, printing the paper, manipulating the paper. Um, but the nice thing for me is that this way of working in three sections or four sections or two sections, it means that you you get another another go at it. You can you can have a section and actually it doesn't work. It doesn't it just doesn't balance. And you can remake a whole whole panel and and match it better. And sometimes that doesn't even work. As you change elements in the in the whole picture and, and maybe beef up a colour, beef up an area, or you uh, a block slips, so you have to introduce black. <laughs> uh, it might mean that you add on bits, but it's nice. It gives you it gives you a way of working that's freer. I think without labouring the point, there becomes more of a relationship between the flat works and the three-dimensional works and the flat works. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
This is, uh, yeah? I'm wondering, like, with the pieces being so large, like, how long does it take for you to prepare your registration, like, for each piece to fit together like a puzzle piece? Sometimes it's really uh, difficult. And sometimes it's uh, surprisingly easy. There are different ways of registering blocks, and it depends how complicated the section is. Um, Almost usually they do have a border. They do have a border. Yeah, usually. almost usually always. And I have a follow-up question: that the subtlety in the work uh, is there a lot of resist? You said you use varnish as a resist. Uh, in that, uh, in this print, there's varnish in this section, and especially with these cut marks in it, it, it it's you know drawing like with a squeegee. Pulling the pulling the sumi ink across the varnish, then the varnish resists the ink. And if you make cut holes, it goes in and out. But it's kind of fun. It becomes an element of chance. In the beginning, you 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 uh, you worry about these things exactly what's going to happen. In the end, you just you just do it. Sometimes, um, usually the varnish part comes in late in the print, but sometimes I start with the varnish part, because if I don't like it, I'll, I'll uh, start it another way. But you, um, what, I, what I worked out for me personally over time, that no matter if you've invested a lot of time in a big, biggish print with different areas and different problems, it's always best just to go for it. You know, if it doesn't work, there's going to be a way of sorting it out. But not to be timid with it. Just, I like the 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 varnish the randomness of that. I enjoy that a lot. So the squeegee is it's really a heavy on the It's coming out the negative line. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to question. I work hard. <laughs> Hang on, the size of the wood. Okay. For these prints, the size of the block? Uh, it varies, but usually um, the, the blocks are. Uh, sometimes they get blocks that are pretty big, but usually they're, you know, about a you know, 90 centimeter by 60 size block. Standard kind of big block size. I think this is nice. I recently exhibited this piece uh, next to this piece with the three D thing. There was a lovely, there was a, lo a lovely relationship happening between the two. And um, uh, satisfying for me. Or which someone was going to ask. Um, do you put any kind of Holding over the print? Yes, I do. Um, it, it's a worry, yeah, because the paper is exposed. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I always talk about that with people who buy them or commission them. And uh, I, the the reason that people are drawn to them is because the paper, because it is a loop. Mm -hmm. It looks, it's mm -hmm. matte. It's it's direct, there's no frame, there's no glass. And um, I always offer uh, the possibility of a Perspex box, and occasionally that happens. So I give it a Perspex box built, goes over the whole thing, and um, I drill it into this panel all the way around. But normally they don't want that. And then what I talk about is I um, spray the whole print about 20 to 30 times with Lasco UV protective spray. Mm. It's a very good product. It's a relatively new product. Uh, and it's uh, not only does it give the print 
potentially a big, much bigger longevity in, in terms of colours and so on. Although I never worry about that either. I always use very high quality pigments. And it's not like a lick of. It's not like a lick of. It's not. Usually they're printed a lot, a lot of pigment pushed right into the paper. Uh, when I spray it with uh, 20 to 30 layers of Glasgow UV spray, which is acrylic based. So in actual fact, what it means is you could take a, a dry cloth and you could dust the thing. It's not going to harm it at all. Because dust is a problem as well. Dust is a big problem for people. Uh, similarly with the sculptural things, they're all sprayed as well, always. Um, the only, only, pro only problem I have, and, and if someone is interested in that particular artwork, is some of the earlier ones I used MDF, and although I painted a lot of uh, layers of sealant, MDF is a product that I think is not a good, it's, it's, it's it's not got a long life. I think there's a lot of acid in it. I have a problem with MDF. I try never to use it now. If I do use it, um, I make sure it's got a lot of sealant on it. A lot. Oh, um, I forgot. I added these on just if we've got time. Um, this was uh, just a very recent uh, exhibition. And again, what, what was nice, this is only about five shots, so I'll just quickly run through them. But I had a residency up in Lewis, which is a small island off the northwest of um, Scotland. And it really showed the process of, the whole exhibition was about the process. And it showed the process of me doing straight watercolours and drawings up there and then uh, work that was woodcuts that related very in almost slightly topographically, although they were always made up for, about the landscape, and then also uh, other abstract drawings, abstracted drawings that I work in parallel with the more topographical drawings, and then also a big big uh, work at the same time. And I illustrate all the tools that I use. Uh, in an exhibition, almost any time I get a chance to, I'll, ex I'll exhibit the tools and try and inform people of what, what's, what's going on in the process. And usually I do demonstrations as well. So you're hand pressing with a bear? Always. Of the large scale? Yeah, yeah, always. Use the only control you can really have. I think that's it. I have a question. I appreciate the geometry in your work. And um, looking back at earlier pieces that um, the forms that are wrapped in the organic uh, less uh, angular. Have you ever um, printed wood that's been cut to shape other than rectangular? The blocks that I'm printing from? Yes. Have you ever cut your blocks into um, any other uh, shape? No. This last one was just illustrating that uh, varnish thing as well with scratches. You can almost get a, uh, like an etching feel to the work if you want. I, I got cautious over some of the work I did was almost topographical uh, of the landscape up there. And then there was these semi-in-between ones. And I just went with it. There's, uh, uh, things started looking like green, I would just go with it. Though I'm cautious, I, I, I don't want things to, to be too literal. That's not what I, that's not what I want. But um, I went with it, people like them, so I did more. Any more questions? Well, it, let's say if you were interested in digital things, how would that change your work, do you think? 
Uh, well, for example, that uh, this print and a series, uh, maybe I did a series of uh, six, twelve, at least twelve of, of this sort of format, and uh, people liked them, people bought them, and they were all one offs. So I would just go back and select one, and then I would make a small edition, ten, twelve, or something like that. Uh, I don't. I guess as well, uh, 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 so sometimes I would just uh, do uh, additional variations. So just drop in another block or cut or do a little bit of reduction printing or something like that. It just sort of makes them unique and it makes it fun to print. Uh, and then sometimes there's a print where I just have to, I'll do, I'll do, do, do addition of fairy because every angle that seems to like it. So I'll just do, do an addition, all the same. Okay.